I was thinking back when I first met you. I think it was Essex County Club, wasn't it? When I was 15 or 16, yeah, when you were, Essex. I was playing Darling Hard. You walked with me off the court, interviewing on your stenography little that little pad you used. Yeah. I remember you flipping it over or little pages or whatever. That's what it was. Yeah. You won either the first or the second set. You played very well. I was quite young, so you were all over it. Like, okay, who's this kid? Exactly. I could tell. Yeah, exactly. I could tell you were saying, you know, who are you? Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> like you said, oh my gosh, I haven't seen you play. And then the next big thing I remember is when you took Karen Hans and me out to uh, dinner after we won the doubles, and you said, are we going to go to the ball? Yeah. You remember that? Sure. We didn't have the money to buy a dress, we, so we couldn't go to the, the Wimbledon ball. We didn't have any money. No. And so you said, okay, girls, I'll take you out to dinner. And you took us out to an Italian dinner in Knightsbridge. And then you, you said, do, we, do you want some champagne? Yeah. And Karen and I don't drink. So you said, good, cheap dates. That's how we celebrated our Wimbledon doubles win. It was the first one for me. I think it might have been the first for Karen, too. But I used to love to go watch you in the media room. It was amazing watching you work. Well, I did work. Well, you sat next to Mike Lupica all the time. And you guys would be typing, talking, like you go, and you're going, da, 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 shoom, da, 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 shoom, da, 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 shoom. <laughs> and I'm, I used to stand in the back and watch you. And you guys would have a, a conversation about, I don't know, were you going to go to dinner that night or whatever, and you're still writing your stories, and you guys would be finished first, finished, see you guys. You're amazing. You just, you really were a good, fast worker, and you have such a style, you know, of, of fun, and, uh, and you always had a nickname for, for everybody. Pretty much, pretty much. I loved it when Bud called me Mother Freedom. I thought, yeah, baby, that's a perfect name for me. It's I just, it goes right to my heart. It resonates. If I said off the record, it was off the record. And so I, I felt like I could be so honest with Bud and, and open. So I want to just share negative and positive thoughts or whatever was going on in my life, the emotional part of me. You know, I felt like I could talk to Bud. He's a terrific writer, terrific historian. But most importantly for me, he's a very, very, very dear friend, and I love him very much. In 1955, American Tony Trabert established himself as the best in the game. He won three of the four majors and finished number one in the world. During that same year, I decided to make a change in my game, leaving the small town life of Berea, Ohio for the big city living of Beantown. I loved Boston immediately when I arrived to go to school at Boston University in the autumn of 1955. My best friend, Bob Beach, had gone to Boston University and gotten a master's degree in public relations. He urged me to do that. He knew I had a terrible scholastic record, but he said, you'll get to Boston, you'll like the place, it'll pep you up. I did well enough to earn a master's degree, but by then I wasn't too excited about it because I was working as a copy boy at the Boston Herald. There I was, something I'd always wanted, to work for a major newspaper. I immediately fell in love with Boston, not the driving. I was going to sell my car. The driving was awful. I managed to make my way through the narrow streets and the roundabouts, people from all over the world. Boston was the place to be, particularly for a young person. The historic elements of Boston, the feeling of education, more than a hundred colleges. I said to myself, this is it. There was so much going on in Boston that I just fell head over heels with that town. Love hearing those stories. Billy Jean King talking about Bud Collins. Tracy, what were your interactions with Bud like? Well, I was 14 years old and at Hilton Head Island, I was playing, after I played a match, he came right up to me as I was walking off the court, just as Billy Jean said, that's what kind of made me laugh. And he started talking to me and I really didn't know who he was. I was so young, I was so shy. I'm sure I didn't have much to say. And we were just in a conversation and then he kept going. And I went, wait, is this an interview? And he said, yes, this is an interview. You just won your match. I'm trying to get some information. And for years <laughs> after that, he would always joke, yep, Tracy, this is an interview. But, uh, you know, just his interaction with the players. I think everybody trusted him because he played the game. As Jimmy said, he played the game well. 
He understood the game. He was a dedicated tennis writer. He wrote about other things, boxing and politics, but really it was the passion that came through. And I think the, the players felt like he was in their court. When are you going to have a writer take a, two 17-year-olds out to dinner after they win Wimbledon? It was a, that's a fantastic story. It was just a much cozier sport. Now they'd have entourages and agents. And it's just uh, he was there from the get-go. And we're very lucky to have had Bud in the sport. That's a great point. We may never see enough. something like that again. Go ahead, Jimmy. Sorry, I was lucky enough to see Bud as well when I was 13 because he would always vacation at the Colony Beach and Tennis Resort. That's where Nick Balateri got started in the academy business, and it was the late 70s, and Bud was already famous in my eyes. I had seen him all the time on TV. Whenever you watch tennis, you saw Bud Collins in those days. And I was just always amazed that he would remember who I was one year later. I'd see him when I was 14 and he'd say, Jimmy Arias, and start talking to me. Um, he had an incredible memory, photographic memory, it seemed, at least for names. Everybody at the academy, there were about 30 students. Paul Anacone was one of them, by the way, that, uh, that would see Bud every year. Jim, Michael, uh, you're in the broadcast game now. How has Bud Collins, watching Bud Collins on TV, influenced the way you commentate, the way you call a match? Well, I think that he always approached everything with honesty, and that's what I try to do when I'm when I'm doing matches, when I'm uh, you know speaking about tennis, is is, is be honest from what I see, um, and and just not not be too hard on people is is one of the things he was always did things with a smile um, and, and gave us the information and. Uh, we hear, hear Billy talking about uh, uh, Italian food. He loved Italian food, and, and I got to know him over quite a few meals uh, in, in Rome, of all places. Uh, he was there often, and we would go to dinner, and, and he, he did have that. Jimmy talks about his memory. It's unbelievable. You, you think now we have such easy access to the Internet, and we can pull up whatever we want for information. We can study things. He had to do this all in his head. And he would tell these great stories. And I was like, how do you remember these things? <laughs> this is unbelievable. Um, but he just had that kind of memory. And, and uh, always, always, though, with a smile on his face when he's telling these great stories. And apparently, as the story goes, other competing columnists, journalists would actually call Bud to get some information. And the <laughs> kind man that he was, he would give it to them even when he was on deadline for his own stories. Much more the about the legendary Bud Collins as Tennis Channel Live continues.